Good morning and uh, welcome to this webinar on mitigating foreign exchange risk for solar projects in emerging markets organized by Solar Power Europe um, in cooperation with Get Invest. So my name is Mate Heiss, I'm Director of Global Affairs at Solar Power Europe and I will be the moderator of today's webinar in which we are bringing a distinguished uh, panel to you to, uh, to discuss this uh, very interesting and a very timely topic. Um, so we know that foreign exchange risk is a major risk solar project developers face, especially in emerging markets with uh, where currency fluctuations may be significant depending on the political and economic context. So in this webinar, what we want to do is to explore how to assess and manage these risks uh, related to changing currencies in the context of emerging markets, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. So we will bring some case studies from Sub-Saharan Africa. And the experts will also point to existing strategies and instruments that investors and project uh, developers can uh, tap into and, and, and benefit from. So um, before introducing our panelists and our speakers i would like to share some housekeeping rules uh, with you if we can go uh, to to the relevant slide um, so there is a possibility to ask questions uh, there will be a panel discussion after a, a, a short series of input presentations so we would like to encourage all participants to use the chat uh, as uh, as shown in uh, on on this slide to ask questions and we will then pick up uh, some of those questions in in the, the panel discussion part. So um, with this, I would like to introduce our panel. Um, and uh, and this is also the order of the, the input presentations that we will have. So we have with us today, uh, Sebastian von Wolf, who is head of financial advisory at Get Invest. Welcome, Sebastian. Patrick Tolani, CEO of uh, Community Energy Social Enterprise Limited from Nigeria. Sylvia Piana, Head of Regulatory Affairs, Africa, Asia and Australia area at NL Green Power. Eric Kaleya, Vice President Africa Connect at DEG. And Per Van Swai, Senior Vice President at TCX Investment Management Company. So, um, with this, I would like to invite Sebastian von Wolf to um, to start with his input presentation. I understand we will learn about Get Invest and Get Invest's initiatives um, to to strengthen local capacities. Sebastian, over to you. Thank you, Marta. Thanks uh, for the introduction. I hope it all works. Sound seems to be working. Yes, yeah, thanks for, the, uh, thanks for having me. And um, I think it's, as you said, it's a, it's a timely moment. It's a good moment um, to talk about this topic. Um, I remember we had a conversation on this some month ago and I'm really glad um, to see this uh, happening now. And also with this, uh, with, with this really uh, distinguished uh, panel. Um, next slide, please. I'm sort of handing over to the control team on, on this, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, I stick to my eight minutes and um, um, I have to say that um, you mentioned Get Invest already supporting this and uh, we are actually proud to support this webinar. Um, and um, we are also in, um, increasingly addressing this topic of um, foreign exchange risk in our activities. And I would like to give you a brief introduction on this in, in the coming slides. Um, next slide, please. Before we start, a brief introduction um, to Get Invest. Get Invest is a European program. It supports investments in decentralized renewable energy. It's implemented by GIZ and uh, mainly supported by the European Union, but also by Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Austria. We work on mainly three areas of activity. Um, from on the advisory support to businesses and companies. That's the finance catalyst. I will show a slide, the next slide on this. Um, we also work on private sector mobilization, um, meaning um, supporting the private sector actually entering into the space. And um, we also do capacity development on various areas. 
we work with associations uh, partners and now also increasingly um, with the uh, domestic financial sector also with the international the development financial institutions obviously but now increasingly with the uh, domestic financial sector next slide please here it is um, so as I mentioned, out of the activities we do at Get Invest, uh, the Finance Catalyst is uh, the biggest and has the, long, the longest track record in advising companies in getting ready for finance. This is our ultimate goal, bringing projects and uh, companies um, uh, to the financier stage or to financial close. Um, we have really grown significantly over the couple of years in our activities. We have more than 30 advisors uh, on the ground and are um, uh, actually proud that we have um, by now supported more than 100 companies all the way to acceptance by financiers. Um, we have reached financial close with almost uh, 40 of these um, uh, activities. And by doing so, we have uh, or we are mobilizing, uh, potentially mobilizing um, around one and a half billion euros of investment. Uh, um, other effects um, are not shown here, but are obviously measured and also reported are job creation, CO2 mitigation, gender empowerment, um, and others. Uh, I would say that the, uh, the finance catalyst is by now in the market the benchmark. There's a couple of other activities in a similar um, area, but uh, we've, um, um, we've really managed to um, position ourselves as, as, as benchmark in the market. Uh, and by doing all these activities and also with this large number of um, advisors being in the field, working with the companies also during COVID times, um, we do have a close ear to the market, obviously. Yeah? And we understand um, if and how finance is happening and also why it's not happening. And this is um, what also leads us to our focus on the topic we're discussing here today. It's one of the focuses. So next slide, please. Here it is. Yeah. I mean, you know that graph. Most of you will, will know that graph. The SME finance gap. It's still there. It still exists. Um, and the companies and and uh, projects we are mainly advising are in that SME uh, uh, space. Sometimes a bit larger as well. And what we see is um, in our financing support activities, it's still mostly driven by outside capital. It's also um, based on this obviously foreign currency. Yeah. Um, this has several side effects, which we are all aware of, and we will also hear about more today. Um, it's linked to high costs, but it's also the foreign, the foreign currency exposure um, for the local companies and businesses. Um, there's also, also other effects. Yeah, If you work with the highly specialized um, international based in Frankfurt or the Valley or wherever, um, uh, impact investors, uh, some of them small, it's difficult to actually grasp and understand this environment for the local businesses we support with the finance catalyst, but uh, there's many out there which are also actually struggling uh, for this. Also, um, working capital is an issue. Um, and last point also, when working with these international um, financiers, um, it's more difficult for the local companies and businesses to develop a long-term relationship, uh, which um, would be helpful for growth and also for um, short-term uh, finance issues. Next slide, please. Yeah, so besides utilizing effective and, and highly specialized hedging instrument, instruments, uh, we will hear of uh, from Pear and others, um, we are at GetInvest convinced that the domestic financial sector can and also should play a catalytic role in enabling more SME-led uh, renewable energy investments by providing local currency and also offering dedicated uh, financing products. Uh, um, we also think it's a good moment to focus on this topic because um, we see increased interest by the uh, domestic financial sector. Um, it's a lot of learning, and I, I could talk more about this uh, maybe later in the discussion. It's a lot of learning from COVID. Yeah? It's a lot of uh, learning from crisis situation. Um, a lot of understanding that the renewable energy and the, the, um, the solar sector has a higher resilience than expected. So um, we see banks uh, being highly interested now in this in this sector and um, um, being interested in, in moving into that and provide and, and um, developing specific funding products for this. 
Plus, of course, as usual, there's a lot of dedicated funding available from the DFIs and on the donor sides. Next slide, please. So based on this, and that's a, the, the small sort of project I would like to, to present to you, uh, which Cat Invest is piloting right now. Um, um, we have started an activity in, in Rwanda and Mozambique. Um, we want to test and see if and how we can activate local currency funding um, for SMEs in, in, in green energy um, by working with the local or the domestic banks. Um, so initially, it's a sort of a, a four-step approach. You can see here on, on the right side of the, of the slide, we, we did sector studies. Um, we developed very hands-on business cases uh, in the renewable energy space and um, also using partly projects out of our own finance catalyst advisory. We have then presented and discussed um, these sort of business studies and cases in a broader financial sector roundtable where we invited uh, the whole sector. And um, after that, the, uh, the banks could apply for more deeper and further support. Uh, and such support is designed to be fully tailored uh, towards the needs of the individual institutions. Um, so we, we are doing this on a very uh, direct one-to-one -one coaching approach. And um, this is very much mirroring the activity we are doing in the Finance Catalyst, where we're also going into the companies and businesses um, on a one-to-one -one approach, very dedicated, tailored um, support on what actually are the hurdles. So we do the same thing now in the financial sector. So by, by doing this, somehow closing the ring or closing the, um, the building the connection between the supply and the demand side. Um, typical topics, we are advising um, loan officers, but also uh, higher level um, bank staff. Uh, it's the usual, it's, it's, it's the risk assessment, due diligence processes, um, development of specific financial products for renewable energy and so on. The good thing is that um, in the activities, we have high interest up to CEO level from the banks, uh, which in our experience is instrumental to actually make uh, this happen and activate more um, local currency. Mm, so in all the activi activities, uh, real project cases are used. I mentioned this for training purposes. And, um, and we also are actually able out of the client space of the banks and um, a couple of, so I would say, sort of dormant uh, projects they're looking into, we're able to activate some of these, um, bring them through the due diligence process, um, arrange for um, uh, um, local currency finance, or transfer to more support um, via our finance catalyst activity. So again, here, closing the link between the two sides, demand and supply. So ultimately, obviously, we hope this will lead uh, to increase the bank's portfolio, enable better access to um, finance for local SMEs and help green the sector. Next, and I think last slide um, is more like uh, um, where we're standing right now and um, what's, the, what's the participants. Um, those of you knowing these, these countries will see that um, in Mozambique, we had high interest and we have now really been able to, to uh, convince, um, uh, I would say, the four most uh, relevant banks in, in Mozambique here, um, joining this coaching approach. And they're really um, getting this hands on um, in their premises uh, because we do have local staff doing this um, and really working on concrete projects um, to increase the understanding and the internal capacity. Same in Rwanda, we're working with two banks. In Rwanda, we've also, um, on a separate stream, uh, teamed up with the Rwanda Bankers Association on a broader sector-wide um, awareness raising and, 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 and webinar activity. Um, next and last slide, please. Um, to close this, um, it, um, clearly this is a this is a pilot we're doing. Yeah, the pilot phase will um, end at uh, the end of this year. Um, but we can already see now, we will evaluate in detail, but we can already see that we want to upscale this both in scope and region in sub-Saharan Africa um, because uh, demand is high, interest is high in the financial sector. Um, of course, this is only one topic. This is only one, I would say, component. Other things like hedging, hedging instruments, uh, dedicated funding and so on also have their role to play. And we're also trying to align and we're also trying to support on um, accessing these instruments um, when we work with the, with the local banks. Yeah. So, um, 
yeah, we are happy to, to see this actually uh, working quite well. We're also very happy how this links with our finance catalyst activities. And um, we are um, yeah, moving this forward. And uh, let's see next year how we can uh, do more and upscale this activity. Yeah, over to you, Martin. Thanks. And of course, open to questions now or later. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, I think this was a really good introduction into today's topic um, and also really good to see that you are providing capacity building to local local banks to do uh, local currency financing. And that's something we could indeed explore later in the panel discussion. But with this, I would like to invite uh, Patrick Tolani, CEO of uh, Community Energy Social Enterprise, to um, give us some insights from, from Nigeria. Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, so, Thank you, organizers, for inviting me to be part of this program. Uh, I don't have slides uh, because this is about uh, sharing the case study of Nigeria. Um, <clears throat> so, as you will know, or uh, probably aware, um, there is a serious uh, energy deficit in Nigeria. To put things in context, uh, a population of about 200 million people, um, if we take out um, generations that are out of the uh, national grid, um, we, we just have less than, or in most cases, about um, four megawatts of electricity to, to go around. Uh, and that shows how, um, how acute the deficit, the energy deficit is in Nigeria. And the general consensus is that decentralized um, and electricity generation uh, could come to the rescue, and particularly uh, leveraging on how simple it is to deploy uh, solar technology, and particularly because of the uh, of the solar radiation in the part of the world where we are. So that offers significant opportunity for us to be able to do quite a lot of work in the area of uh, solar generation in the country. Uh, but, but the big question then is, most of the components we need, we need, will have to be imported. And so, and because most of these components have got to be imported, then you need to look for forex to import them. Virtually, of course, we are struggling and we are doing all we could in the country to increase the 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 the, the local content uh, for solar components in Nigeria, but it's not going to happen overnight. The government is doing all it can to make that happen, but that's not really hap uh, happening immediately. So now the problem is because as a country, we struggle with our exports. It's, we are virtually one product <laughs> exporting country, which is just oil. And, and everybody will know how volatile the oil market could be. Uh, oil accounts today for more than 70% of our uh, external earnings. So that means, as a country, we have to struggle with balance of payment challenges. And those things affect access to forex, to, to, to foreign currency in the country. And as a result, the central bank and government policy has to be involved in ensuring that those who need it most for the development of the country have access to that. But those good intentions are there, but the truth of the matter is that when government has to interfere and policies are changed virtually every time, then you find out that there'll be distortion and markets don't like distortions. Free market is still the best way to run any economy. And so without the free market being able to source for Forex easily 
And of course, because we don't have just one uh, Forex regime, we have different foreign regimes. And of course, international partners, investors, and everybody have been saying, let's have just a unified exchange rate in the country so that everybody can, can predict what will happen and how you can source for uh, Forex for your imports. And so that becomes a dilemma for anybody who wants to invest in the sector in Nigeria. And more so to complicate things, um, when banks want to give loan in the country, I think because of the CBA regulations, the Central Bank of Nigeria regulations, they have to give the loan in Naira. They can't give the loan in dollars. Secondly, even for those of us who are working with mini grid and there is a Nigerian electrification project, uh, World Bank and Rural Electrification of Nigeria, Agency of Nigeria, uh, uh, REA, the subsidies are also paid in Naira. And, and more importantly also, unfortunately, your clients or your customers will pay in Naira. So the dilemma therefore is, if everybody, if your bank will pay you in Naira, your customers will pay you in Naira, government bodies that provide subsidies will pay you in Naira, then the question is, where do you get the dollars from or the pounds or whichever forex you are using? Where do you get it from? And that has been the dilemma that most of developers or investors find in the country. And of course, again, it's complicated by the fact that besides the fact that you have to import in forex, if you are a foreign investor, you also have to repatriate your funds. And that again has to be done in a foreign currency. So I'm sharing this, um, this, the, this case study so that my colleagues who are, who are also part of this, uh, this, this call or this uh, webinar will be able to understand the challenges that both local and foreign investors will face if you want to invest in the country. Now, I'm delighted uh, to hear that one of the ways to go about this is to, particularly if we want to have investors coming from abroad or institutional partners, if the money is made available to us in local currency. But again, if it is made available in local currency, we still have to struggle to get the forex to, to pay for the for the import. Uh, one of the things that has also been raised by some of the people I speak to, maybe in banks or international organization, is the importance of edging instruments. How do we deploy such instrument to 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 help the system? So th those are the uh, the the challenges we face in our own environment. Uh, limiting myself to my eight minutes, I think um, those, those, those issues, I know I have one minute more, but I want to yield it um, so that others can also take advantage of that and probably use the opportunity to provide us with solution because we, we need those solutions. We have policy issues, we have institutional issues, and we just need support uh, to, to overcome these issues and uh, allow this technology and this opportunity to leverage on solar to reduce the kilowatt divide in Nigeria. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I think that you've shed light very well on this multifaceted dilemma that even if you um, go for a uh, local currency financing for your for your project, you will have the dilemma even if you get um, um, 
cryptocurrency funding, you get you get the dilemma. So let's see if the um, if the other speakers and especially the experts on on hedging and foreign exchange um, risk mitigation will be able to give us some uh, some solutions to these dilemmas. So with this, I would like to invite our next speaker, who is Silvia Piana, head of regulatory affairs for Africa, Asia, and Australia area at NL Green Power, uh, a leading developer uh, of renewable energy projects in emerging markets, including Africa, uh, who is, of course, also exposed to these risks. Uh, so let's hear from NL Green Power's perspective. Uh, what are those risks and how do you deal with them? Silvia, over to you. Thank you, Matej. So today I'm going to uh, talk to you about the private investors and namely the IPP, the Independent Power Producer Perception of this uh, foreign exchange risk uh, and correlated risk. So let me just briefly introduce you my company and the, the, the international footprint of my company. We have experience in emerging economies, particularly in Africa. We have operating capacity in uh, South Africa, in Zambia, in Morocco, and we have won a project in Ethiopia and we have a pipeline in, uh, in Kenya. This is a slide I very often use to start my, my speech and it shows in the uh, green circles all the macroeconomic and demographic trends that favor the deployment of renewable energies in, uh, in, renewable, in uh, emerging economies. In the orange circles you see the difficulties that, uh, I mean, the space for improvement in other areas. Today, we are going to focus on the de-risking instruments and particularly on some financial uh, de-risking instruments. Uh, you all know that the high cost of project financing in emerging countries uh, leads to the need to correctly assess the project risk in all the project phases from construction to operation and to have appropriate mitigation in place. And the best instruments to mitigate those risks are a good uh, project finance structure and a bankable PPA. When it comes to financial risk mitigation, here is a list of the main financial risks, but today we are going to talk about a couple of them. One is the exchange rate risk and Mr. Tulani uh, previously has already introduce to you the importance of this risk. So basically, we uh, project developers, we uh, borrow money from international banks in strong currency, but we get revenues from our projects in local currency. The PPAs are usually quite long, 20, 25 years. So it's very usual, I, I would say, it's, uh, it always happened that the local currency devaluates along all this time. This leads to uh, lower returns of the project and also, more importantly, to the reduction of investments in, uh, in the country due to the loss of confidence uh, by investors. Of course, the best solution is to have the off-take payment obligation denominated in the same hard currency. This sometimes happens, but we'll see later on that, for instance, in Kenya, where this happens, then there are problems anyway. So this is the optimal solution, but just from the perspective of private investors. Mm, and there may be hedging solution, usually in the form of financial derivatives on the over-the-counter markets, but they are usually not available in, uh, in emerging economies, and if available, they're very expensive. So this will increase the financial cost of debt and ultimately will offset the initial benefit coming from uh, being able to borrow money uh, in, in cheap foreign loans. Uh, a correlated risk is the currency convertibility and transferability because, okay, you get revenues in whatever, I mean, in local currency, but then you need to convert this currency and to repatriate it. And if you're not able to get the uh, revenues already in the hard currency, you need some form of convertibility guarantees. Uh, very often we see that the governments are supported by international institutions such as the World Bank or all the institutions represented by the speakers today uh, and this support is really very very precious. Uh, in general, and this is the solution we see has been chosen for Ethiopia, uh, government could allocate some amount of foreign currency to commercial banks but if the banks eventually face to avail the foreign currency, the government must take the responsibility for the availability of uh, foreign currency and the transferability of this currency. I saved most of my time to uh, talk to you about a practical case, Ethiopia, because I mean, practical examples are always useful to, to better understand the, the situation. In Ethiopia, currency is an issue. 
is an issue because it's a closed and, and local economy that does not generate flows in strong currency. This is different from instance from other countries such as, I don't know, Zambia, who, which has copper, uh, which uh, are endowed with local resources that are traded internationally. So they, uh, the, their currency, their local currency has some, um, some possibility to be easily converted, but this is not the case uh, with the beer in Ethiopia. Um, and currency convertibility in Ethiopia, due to the scarcity of foreign uh, currency, is regulated by an old law, which states that uh, what are the economy sectors that have priority in currency convertibility. And this ranking is linked to the characteristic of the economy. So first, must be paying strong currency, the investment in the medical sector, for instance, the purchase of medicines from abroad, then comes the agricultural sector, and so on and so forth, until the last category, which is generic private foreign investment. And here falls the energy sector. So the energy sector is in the last order of priority in this country. Now in this situation, when the scaling solar tender was uh, held in 2019, led by the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, they provided close that guaranteed the currency convertibility. But what happened? It happened that project agreements were unilaterally modified by the European, uh, sorry, by the Ethiopian uh, tender authorities pretty close to the bid submission date. And they amended some material condition that made the project agreements bankable. And I'm precisely referring to the guarantee uh, uh, of convertibility uh, on local to hard currency. And also they limited the operation of offshore accounts that were used for transferability. So it was created a very strong control mechanism on offshore accounts by the Ethiopia National Bank, meaning that even if one player was able to convert the currency, it was almost impossible to transfer that money out of the country. So at the end of the story, four bidders out of five that were pre-qualified, including my company and Green Power, were deemed to be non-compliant by the tender authority because their bid response was conditioned to the reintegration of those amended or erased uh, condition. And the tender was won by the Saudi company Aquapower. By the way, for one project with a very, very low tariff, around $25, that is still used as a benchmark because it was maybe the lowest tariff, uh, solar tariff in, in Africa at the time, uh, the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, withdrew its financing support as a consequence of the changes in the project agreement, uh, they remained only involved as, um, as a transaction advisor to the program. Aquapower managed to sign the project agreement, so the PPA and the implementation agreement, but they did not reach the financial close. What happened that very recently in August this year, so after two years, in what it defined a, a major policy shift, the government eventually admitted the importance of the currency convertibility for foreign investors. And they studied some solution to, to make the projects in pipeline uh, able to reach the financial close. Uh, one of the solution examined was to save some amount of foreign currency uh, that the national utility, the Ethiopian electric power, generates from power export in order to use it. But then the optimal solution was, uh, I mean, the, the solution identified, not yet applied, but it will be applied soon, we guess, um, was actually to guarantee the uh, convertibility. So some amount of foreign currency will be allocated to commercial banks, uh, and eventually this uh, um, responsibility for the convertibility uh, is on the Ministry of, of uh, Finance. Uh, I think my eight minutes are gone, so let me just very quickly describe to you another uh, case, the, the Kenya case. So Kenya is in the middle of PPA renegotiation and uh, they want to lower the tariff. Uh, and one of the, 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 the problem is that in Kenya, the PPAs are actually in uh, usually in US dollar or in Euro. And this, uh, uh, so the, the, the this risk, the foreign exchange risk, is on the off-taker, and this is creating problems to, to the economy. Uh, so a task force nominated by the president recommended that all future PPAs uh, need to be denominated in, uh, in Kenya shillings. But I stop here because maybe there will be time later on to, to discuss further about Kenya. So over to you, Matteo. 
Thank you very much, Sylvia. And I think, um, uh, just like Patrick, you managed to um, uh, to shed light on the, the the challenges related to foreign exchange convertibility and foreign exchange risk very very well. So um, let's now invite um, Eric Kalea, Vice President, Africa Connect at uh, DEG, to uh, to tell us uh, what DEG. Uh, uh, an international financer is doing to address these risks and then afterwards we will also hear from Pair One Swai from, from TCX which is uh, a company specializing really on, on uh, foreign exchange risk mitigation and, and hedging instruments. So um, Eric, over to you. Yeah, thank you Marta and a, a very warm welcome from me from Cologne in, in Germany. I'm really happy and um, to, to present to you today um, what our experiences are in terms of uh, local currency and um, foreign currency hedging and also um, which instruments we can offer. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide. Uh, BEG is a part of KFW Group, um, a very large state-owned um, development and promotional bank. And we are a private sector financing um, bank. Um, we focus really on private sector projects. Um, one main um, sector is the infrastructure sector in which we have a portfolio of around 2 billion euros um, worldwide. And around 400 million of those are um, projects related to solar power. Next slide, please. KFW um, has a, a huge presence uh, worldwide with around 80 offices um, and 13 offices are dedicated DEG offices. Um, so that really allows us to be very close to the market, um, to understand local markets and also to cooperate very closely with our partners um, that, that have their headquarters and, and in those markets. Um, and also, of course, to exchange this knowledge and experiences with you. Next slide. Um, as you might know, DEG is not the, the only development finance institution um, in, in Europe. Um, there's a strong network of European DFIs, um, so-called ETFIs, European Development Finance Institutions. And um, it's just to mention that all of them have their own programs and um, instruments. Um, in, in a lot of projects, we are collaborating very closely together. We co-finance. Um, we have a so-called friendship uh, facility between um, FMO, DEG, and, uh, and, um, and Propaco, which allows us to, to mobilize larger amounts. And then there are also um, investment facilities like, for example, ICCF um, from the EU together with the EIB, which allows us also to, to bring in additional finance on a, on a very lean and efficient manner. Next slide, please. Um, I, speaking about uh, mitigating foreign currency risks, um, just to from a very macro perspective, um, it's always actually about that there is a, a mismatch between the currency in which either the bank has its loan agreement or its home currency or the, the equity providers uh, want to see their return and actually um, yeah, the, the, the currency in which the, the energy sales contract um, is being denominated. So um, if we go down and there are maybe two main um, structures here, the one is the classical independent power producer utility structure in which um, banks and equity providers provide funding to an IPP. And um, this IPP, of course, has a contract with usually a state-owned off-taker. And this um, contract, this power purchase agreement, can be in, in, in foreign currency denominated or in local currency. Um, I think that was also um, highlighted by, by Sylvia. And, um, if it is in, in, in foreign currency, it's, of course, much easier for, for the banks than, and, and the equity providers because they, they have a much easier way to, to receive um, their return in, in, in foreign currency, usually in, in dollar, but also we have seen um, euro-denominated PPAs, for example, in, in Kenya. But, of course, the, the, the um, foreign currency risk is not completely away. Um, because then the, the off-taker basically takes the risk 
um, and, and usually pushes it down to its end clients, um, which were so-called foreign exchange surcharges. So, for example, if there's a strong devaluation of the local currency, um, then the end client will see this as a surcharge on its um, monthly bill. And um, I lived myself in, in Kenya, so um, you could see monthly um, if, there, if there's a, a respective uh, surcharge. So it's, um, so it's just a way of kind of um, who takes the risk. In this case, if it's a local currency um, um, PPA, it's, it's the end consumer um, usually. Um, and this, um, if we go to the right and we see um, now the, the, just the structure of a classical um, funding um, for, for captive power or private power purchase agreements or also commercial industrial solar, you could also say um, sometimes paygo companies, very similar. Um, of course, you also have uh, um, the bank and equity providers financing this restrictive um, project company. And um, then they, they actually provide um, um, electricity to their, their end clients, either industrial or, or private end clients, for example, if it's a, a solar home um, uh, um, systems provider. And, um, and you have more or less the same issue. So if um, the end clients, for example, it's an industrial, it it's, um, could be a mine, um, which generates um, commodity-based hard currency income, um, then the PPA usually is then also in uh, in a hard currency and uh, the funding can be in, in a hard currency. But if it's just a, a local currency income, uh, then of course it, it's much better to have uh, local currency um, funding agreements also to uh, mitigate uh, this, this, this funding or this currency mismatch. Um, and there are several levels on which um, um, support can be given. Of course, the basic, very basic one, which I mentioned, it's, it's the, the natural hedge really to see, okay, if there is a um, hard currency income, then this, then there is lo logically no real hard, uh, no, no re real um, foreign currency risk because it, it matches um, then the, the funding agreements in, in the hard currency. Um, but um, but the, the next level you could see um, on, on in blue is, um, and that was also something um, Sylvia mentioned, the, the government um, can support local currency um, PPAs by uh, basically get guaranteeing um, the convertibility and also in a way availability of hard currency. And um, Ethiopia, as Sylvia mentioned, it's a very good example because there specifically it's a challenge to really have um, sufficient um, hard currency. And maybe one additional remark also if you think about to take a political risk insurance for transfer and convertibility risk, usually it's only actually provided if you have also a government support and the government guarantee that there will be sufficient um, uh, local current um, hard currency available. So MIGA won't give you um, PRI if the government is not supporting the, the project in this regard. Um, then on the level of the IPPs, there are also certain liquidity support instruments um, available. I can come to it later in, in a minute. And of course, um, mainly what we're talking today about is the, the kind of yellow bar you see here. Um, this is um, the lo either local currency funding directly from, from local banks or actually hedging instruments um, which can be offered by, by DFIs and also their, their partners. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there are different types of power purchasing or purchase agreement, um, and I, I try to break them down very roughly. So on, on the left side, you see the utility IPP. It's usually very long term with a parastatal utility. As I said, it can be local currency or foreign currency. And um, net, usually the, the natural hedge for the off taker is not really uh, available. Yeah, I mean, the, the local uh, population pays its electricity bill in local currency. Um, then we have this private PPA captive power. Um, so usually it's with large mining companies, um, for example, or cement plants. And there um, you can have a possibly a, um, a, a natural hedge, as I said, if it's commodity-based income. In distributed solar, for example, in commercial and for commercial and industrial, um, you, you can also really ha have a, a local or an end of foreign currency income um, but it really depends on the mix of the portfolio of these C&I companies. 
And with the distributed solar solar home systems, Paygo, um, basically um, you usually have um, local currency. So so there's always really um, a local currency element in in the in the income and usually um, requirements for for hedging. And um, so basically, depending on the contract currency, hedging solutions are required in in all subsectors of of solar um, uh, power, solar projects. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. So how how can it be uh, mitigated? And um, maybe I, I because of um, looking at the time, I just concentrate on the last two um, um, col um, uh, lines here. So. Um, so as I said, with with PPAs denominated in dollar, usually it's it's mitigated via um, FX surcharge uh, to the end consumer. Um, but there can also be, for example, FX reserve accounts um, on the on the level of um, also the IPP or the off taker. Um, and for example, there's the regional liquidity support facility from ATI that could support this uh, on the level of of the off taker. Um, if we go to local currency based um, PPAs but indexed to um, to foreign currency and um, that, that is something that we see also I think that's also the case in, in Ethiopia really um, then you can also speak about this um, yeah um, then then really it's important that the government provides um, a convertibility and transferability guarantee um, and also um, because you receive local currency and you really need to make sure that you get them out of the country and and then in con be able to convert them in us dollars um, and then this can be also being added or supported by foreign um, um, reserve uh, rec accounts and also the regional liquidity support facility and then there is the eu transfer and con convertibility facility uh, which is also a liquidity instrument basically to to have like a, an additional buffer for like um, for currency risk and liquidity risks and um, and of course then there are um, hedging solutions available and um, if it is a, a local currency based um, PPA um, then um, of course similar instruments but basically also um, it's local currency from local banks and and hedging uh, available yeah next slide. Um, the products offered for for hedging can be roughly um, distinguished between say um, established emer um, emerging market currencies so think about um, for example um, the south african rent or mexican peso and and so on and really more exotic um, um, currencies um, from from countries that don't have really established um, swap markets and um, and there are mainly two instruments broadly available so it's it's a deliverable swap and a, a non-deliverable swap and um and depending on uh, which currencies to be hedged uh, that that can be offered um by us and and the the main difference there is really the the settlement currency um and and also um who remains with the, the transfer risk um and and um that that of course differs depending on on the currencies on of the settlement um so one example, for example, for, for classical um, local currency funding we recently provided is um, a concentrated solar power project um, in South Africa called a Redstone. Um, that was an 18-year funding in um, South African rent, and um, we provided this directly as DEG, and, and our treasury actually hedged this in, in the markets um, because there is a, a, a liquid swap market available for South African rent. And, and so we could provide really the, the local currency um, long term um, directly. Um, and another example um, where we used basically also, and um, I'm happy to see a pair van and Zwei, um, on, on the panel um, next presenter, um, an instrument uh, offered by TCX um, that was for, for Yellow Door in, in Jordan. Um, we, we could offer this um, this currency um, via TCX and specifically for DEG it works through a mechanism called a GIIF and um, and these are basically um, non-deliverable um, um, swaps and I guess um, Pierre will will give us some more um, insight into it um, for DEG specifically if we offer these say more exotic um, emerging market currencies um, we we 
the, the project has to fulfill certain eligibility uh, criteria and, and then but that's really project and, and country specific and, and we can discuss this um, yeah, um, regarding the projects on, on a spot, uh, project uh, specific basis. Um, the, the other currencies um, from established emerging markets, um, as I mentioned, it can see from, from China, Indonesia, Mexico, Philippines, um, Russia, um, Turkey and, and South Africa. Um, and, and we are also uh, looking to do more in currencies directly in, in uh, South America, which is currently being um, in the testing phase. So there, there is, um, and honestly, I think the other DFIs provide similar or sometimes even more uh, hedging um, uh, solutions. And TCX is, is very, very much the, the expert for, for exotic um, emerging market currencies, which more or less all of the, the DFIs closely co collaborate. Yeah. Um, Next slide. Yeah, that's that's. I think basically it. I, I think also my time has run out. So thank you very much for for your attention and um, happy to take on also further questions during the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Eric, and, and thank you for already introducing the next speaker, uh, Pierre Van Sai uh, from TCX Investment Management Company. And you mentioned that uh, you work together with um, hedging solutions providers such as TCX, um, who, uh, and now we will hear from Pierre about, um, well, hedging solutions. Pierre, over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, you hear me well? Great. Uh, awesome. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was really nice. Every single speaker I thought was uh, well to, to us, me personally, interesting. Uh, great overview uh, from Eric. Uh, DG, of course, is one of our clients. Uh, I've known Eric also for a long time. Uh, we've spoken about these topics many times before. I uh, thought that was a great overview. Um, how shall I do this? Let me run through my slides quickly and then make some connections with with some of the things that were said. Uh, quick introduction, me, I, I've been with TCX, I joined shortly after the business was started uh, 12, 13 years ago, so I've been there over 10 years. Before that I was with uh, FMO in, in the African Project Finance team, so uh, also sat on that side of energy transactions. Um, TCX, I think I hit the next slide, if not somebody else might do it. Um, I wait. I wait, I wait for it to shift. Next slide, there we go. Um, so T, yeah, you see here also the KFW group. TCX is a joint venture of basically a number of European governments, the European Union, who uh, provide the first lost risk capital to the fund. And then essentially all the major development finance banks, we all came together, uh, brought a lot of capital together with one single purpose to start offering currency derivatives in the markets where commercial banks are not, were not yet doing that. Why? Uh, to enable uh, all these shareholders, the DFIs, but also a whole range of other impact investors to start lending in any local currency in any frontier market. So we provide the hedging product. Mostly it is the lenders that then provide a local currency loan that is hedged with us. The upshot of that is that as of today, there is really not a lender in the impact world that uh, if it would want to lend in local currency for any type of tenor, for any type of volume, cannot do so. So essentially any individual uh, DFI or impact investor can now lend long-term in local currency. Next slide. Uh, yeah, we cover, uh, I'll immediately hit next slide, we're we are a global fund, we cover actively 60, 70 currencies worldwide. We have been, uh, we've probably hedged over that uh, 10, 12 year period plus yeah, more than the $10 billion equivalent of local currency loans. Current portfolio is $5 billion equivalent, 55 currencies. We cover all sub-Saharan African currencies except for uh, the Maghreb countries and, and South Africa, simply because the commercial banks cover those markets very, very well. Um, yeah, a lot of it has already been said. So um, this breakdown, uh, yeah, I think it's important. On-grid, off-grid is an essential distinction. Uh, Eric was also making that. Um, 
yeah, in the ongoing universe in emerging and frontier markets, uh, the, the major distinction is indeed uh, the currency denomination, who is taking the exchange rate risk on power purchase agreements, the IPPs of the or the off taker. What we see uh, is that in the more frontier markets, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, uh, yeah, Ghana, uh, Uganda, the the PPAs are still is a historical situation denominated in dollars, meaning that the off-taker absorbs that exchange rate risk. And as was said earlier, it's upon the off-taker to either bear uh, exchange rate volatility or pass it on to consumers or potentially hedge. We've been talking to many utilities, but especially in East Africa, also on hedging uh, and also on uh, yeah, transitioning away from dollar PPAs to uh, local currency PPAs. Uh, Sylvia was mentioning the, the, the PPA review process in Kenya, which has been recently completed. Uh, we have over the past, uh, past six or ten months been quite actively involved with that process and have uh, been you know, had bilateral engagement with that task force, uh, submitted the case for local currency, uh, demonstrated uh, the, the, the benefits and also uh, you know, highlighted the fact that as of today, uh, shilling PPAs can be funded with a shilling debt from onshore sources, but also, as I said earlier, from offshore sources. Um, so that's we've been sort of instrumental in that discussion. We have to see what the next phase is going to be. Uh, but the government has said that, in principle, they now want to move to shilling PPAs. I don't think it will move that fast. But the fact that uh, the issue is now on the table is by itself quite uh, significant. Um, and the other thing is what we see in the more emerging markets, South Africa. Of course, Morocco, um, yeah, and in, in other countries like Colombia and Brazil, Indonesia, all these markets have eventually uh, transitioned away from dollar PPAs to local currency PPAs, uh, saying uh, that they will no longer, uh, you know, uh, accept uh, exchange rate risk per se, uh, knowing that there are other uh, solutions out there. Um, so that's a, a normal uh, transition to happen, and it is inevitable that it will also happen in all these sub-Saharan African markets. Um, of course, if you have a dollar PPA, you want dollar funding. If you have a local currency PPA, you want local currency funding. In the off-grid world, it's a little bit different. You don't have uh, utilities. It's more a consumer leasing product, no utility involved. There's no tariff or financial regulation, which means that while the businesses in that sector all generate local currency revenue because they're not regulated, you see that uh, a CNI company or a Pago company or a Minigrid company essentially has the choice uh, because of the non-regulation factor that has a choice of borrowing in dollars or in local currency. Um, and, and you see a mixed bag. You see that some of the, the loans that have been going into the sector over the past five years are in dollars, some are in local currency, some are hedged by us. Um, and there's also uh, now a, some degree of uh, onshore borrowing, although as far as I can oversee, it's still very, very limited, which is great why, uh, why institutions like uh, Get Invest are playing a role in trying to uh, promote greater uh, participation of onshore debt markets in that uh, sector. Um, yeah, I think I already, uh, I already said what our message is, but uh the main message in the on-grid world is this transition away from dollar ppas to local currency ppas we believe generally is a good thing as i said it's an inevitable uh transition uh, as uh, economies mature uh, and domestic savings capacity also grows it's inevitable that that transition will happen and our message is that that's fine certainly from a debt point of view because all debt that is currently going into these sectors in dollars can also be provided in local currency naturally there's this issue of uh, higher interest rates and how does that relates to the uh, the real cost to projects but i i can assure you that uh, in the long run uh, every energy sector should be financed as a local currency which is precisely why all emerging and developed and developed markets do that um and the message in the off-grid sector is that that is a, a because you have this choice uh, for borrowers and therefore also for lenders to decide on the currency on each individual case? There's a we, we think there's some systemic risk with that. If everybody does it, you're doing the same what happened 20, 30 years ago in the microfinance sector, where still everything was done in dollars. 
it might make sense for an individual lender or borrower to make that decision, but it's not necessarily the best thing for the sector as a whole, for the economy as a whole. So we do think it's uh, it's uh, there's a there is a systemic argument to promote uh, local currency uh, lending, and we are also working on programs that that incentivize the uptake of uh, local currency. And maybe we'll have some time to discuss that later. And it definitely also relates to the, uh, the initiative that Sebastian was talking about. You know, the, the financing of uh, mini grids, off grids uh, by local banks. How does that relate to financing offers in local currency from international banks that we support? Um, maybe final comment uh, is that, uh, yeah, our product is is a non-deliverable swap. It supports a synthetic local currency loan. It solves the currency risk problem. It eliminates currency volatility uh, from uh, financings, but it does not. Uh, it does not uh, deal with the conversion risk. It does not deal with the transfer risk. The risk, of course, that uh, that Patrick and Sylvia were talking about in Nigeria and Ethiopia, respectively. Uh, we unfortunately don't have a presence in these countries, and we cannot create dollar liquidity uh yeah in the same way that nobody else really can do that that's a that's a very country specific uh issue which we unfortunately cannot help with um yeah i think many other things to talk about this is a, a slide that we may come to if people have a, a question around cost of local currency but i'll stop talking here and uh, hand back to the to the organizers for um yeah the next phase Thank you. Thank you, Per. Um, and uh, thank you to all the speakers for the input presentations. I would like to invite now all our distinguished panelists to turn on their cameras. Uh, and we still have a bit less than 30 minutes for uh, for a panel discussion. And actually, one of the things that most of you, all of you addressed is local uh, currency financing. There seems to be a trend towards moving towards local currency funding. And so um, I would suggest to, to explore this topic a little bit in the first, let's say, 10, 15 minutes of our discussion. Uh, turning to you, Patrick, first. So what's your experience when it comes to uh, local currency financing? So when you approach domestic banks and, and uh, ask for, for, for local currency financing in Nigeria, what, what are the reactions? Are banks in, in the position to, to offer the financing that you need in local currency for your uh, solar projects? Yes, indeed. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 first, the first loan we, we got from a commercial bank Naturally, the banks in Nigeria will, will give you the loans in, in local currency, not in foreign currency. So, so there's no question about getting loans in foreign currency. Now, we wanted to pay for the materials to be uh, imported into the country. And then I needed dollars. So. I needed to change the money from Naira to dollar. And then I was confronted with this reality that there is the likelihood that I will not get this money using the CBN rate, Central Bank of Nigeria rate. So that means this money could be sourced from the parallel market. And so if that had to happen, Immediately, I would have lost 30% of the money to foreign exchange problem. And so what I did was to reject the loan because there was simply no way that could work. That was the experience I had, say, about uh, two years ago. But Recently, what we are trying to do is to see whether the banks will now be more emphatic to say, yes, you can get this loan at the approved CBN rate, which would then reduce the money that I would have lost. And that's the challenge we face. But even when that happens, you still need to wait for a very long time because the C Central Bank of Nigeria has a lot of backlog 
of payment to be made. So those are the challenges we have. Of course, the, the hedging solution and all those things, lending in local currency, they sound great to us and they are, they are wonderful. But if we really cannot have access to Forex to buy the components or for you to repatriate money to those you are going to pay uh, or your investors who have put money into your project, then that poses a lot of challenge. And, I, and I'd be so, so excited if some of uh, the presenters could, could help us around the way to address this dilemma. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Patrick. And, and I would like to um, pass this challenge over to, to Sebastian because, I mean, you described, Sebastian, that Get Invest, you, as Get Invest, you work in several countries across Africa supporting uh, local banks, uh, building capacities, so local banks are able to provide loans in, um, in, 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 in local currency. Um, but, uh, but there are these open challenges that uh, were described by Patrick, namely the fact that it's difficult to buy equipment that needs to be paid for in, in, in foreign currency and also the repatriation in the case of international investors. Are these challenges being, being addressed by you or how do you account for these challenges in your efforts, uh, in your capacity building efforts? Yeah, thanks, thanks Marty. And uh, I'm for sure not able to solve all these issues uh, <laughs> immediately. Uh, this is sort of, uh, this needs uh, all of us to work on this and, and we are focusing on, on specific aspects on this. And, I think uh, what we what was also interesting here to hear is also we need to understand that each market, each country has a different uh, uh, setup. Yeah, so we, we don't have this one solution. It really depends on on, on details. And um, I mean, one thing is also for sure um, there is a lot of money available in most of the markets in local currency. Um, so the banks are typically sitting on it or investing in in, in T bills or, or or bonds or other things which is not um, sort of what really uh, uh, supports uh, the, the growth of the economy. So it's also, again, here, besides what we're doing in terms of capacity, um, this is also a regulatory topic, for example. Uh, so um, there's so many aspects to this. To, to, to this. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of find this one solution. So um, this is why also our advisors from the uh, finance catalysts are, are sort of some of them are really deep into this topic because they need to find the solution. I mean, also when I saw um, Eric's uh, graph with the different aspects and the different tools and approaches, I mean, someone has to understand this. Yeah. And this is sort of coming back um, uh, to your question, um, what's the situation of the local companies and, and SMEs and at GetInvest, we are focusing on the smaller, medium-sized ones, a lot of CNI, also off-grid, Paygo and so on. For these, it's impossible to understand all this. Yeah, for these, it's this is sort of um, uh, very high level, very complicated. Um, so uh, they are somehow lost. They need advice on this. Um, many of their um, transactions are also too small um, for for hedging instruments. So this is why we are going this route with the with the local um, with the local banks. And um, what we found there, sort of coming to your question sort of on, on, on what's the, the position of the local companies, what we found is that, um, interesting enough, um, many of them or some of them don't even sort of uh, think about uh, approaching the, the domestic financial sector because they think, ah, oh, it's a local bank, it's too complicated. Um, so they don't have this approach as, okay, um, um, let's try. They rather sort of um, think like it's not going to work for, for several reasons. So um, some of uh, the activities um, or, or one component of the activities from what we're doing is really bringing them together and sort of also making them speak and making them understand uh, each other's language. Yeah? And again, I'm not talking about the large um, IPP grid connected things where um, which, which also Silvia talked about. This is a different world. So we're really talking about small, local, medium sized SMEs. And they need to understand that the bank can actually be an important partner, um, also in terms of growth. And what, what they also need besides um, investments is also is very often um, working capital. Yeah? And all these kind of things, sort of the day-to-day -day business of a local pay or a local um, small um, CRI company, 
um, they need a partner in the local financial sector. Yeah? And this is um, um, our perception um, that is needed, there's support needed, and there, the potential is there. And um, sort of last, last sentence, notwithstanding this, um, um, very often a mix of finance is also an opportunity. Yeah? And so this is what our advisors are working on, because yes, for importing equipment, you need Forex. And this can be structured uh, uh, differently then. Yeah, so Thank I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Sebastian. And, and so you're saying that uh, local banks in some countries, at least, are, aren't really investing in, um, in in renewable energy projects, rather other uh, other segments of the economy, or, or not even segments of the economy, but bonds. That's what you're saying. So what do you do as uh, get invest to engage with local banks and to convince them to start investing in renew renewable energy projects? Yeah, I think this has been debated over in many uh, uh, conferences in the evening at the hotel bars. How do you actually um, convince the, the, the local financial sector? Because, of course, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, risk, and, and, but also in terms of uh, revenues, um, in some regions and countries, the government are offering products which are much more attractive to the local financial sector. So it's about um, regulation on one side, supporting them, but also um, um, as I said uh, uh, already in my presentation, it, there is a change in, in some of the institutions. Yeah, I mean, we, we only work with the champions and the ones which are really open for this because they understand they need to diversify. They also understand that there's a political push towards um, developing the sector. Some of them also feel a sort of, I would say, responsibility. And the, the interesting turning point is really understanding risk, understanding technology, understanding the asset class, um, supporting the banks um, in developing specific products, uh, lending products um, for this. And um, right now, um, sort of in the wake or during, I have to say, unfortunately, during the COVID crisis, also there is a, there is a, a phase of re-evaluating risk, um, uh, uh, looking at different markets um, out of the um, experience now. And also, as I said, energy um, is, is a basic need. Um, it's uh, people keep on paying, so um, the 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 banks, when it comes to paying, on others understand. Okay, we need to reevaluate our risk, and we have to look into this. At last point, also the financial sector understands this sector is going to stay. This is going to grow. Um, there's also an, um, it's an opportunity, but it's also there is a certain um, need to to be involved in this. Yeah. Thank you, Sebastian. Hey, so we comment on this, huh? <laughs> Yeah, th thank you indeed. So, uh, so I would indeed like to invite Eric to uh, to, to to comment on this because um, so we 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 are seeing that local banks are increasingly financing renewable energy projects in, in local currency, and and so are you as the DEG. So, is there a competition? Is there are there certain markets uh, where it is difficult for you to compete with local banks? Yeah, I mean, certainly there are, um, say, worldwide uh, markets which have very well established long-term local financing uh, solutions. I mean, look at India, look at South America, Brazil. Uh, they, they, they are, um, the more the market is developed, the better really you also get uh, local currency funding even very long term and and then sometimes it's even the question what is the role of a development finance institutions when there is a very well developed local banking market um that what is and and but of course especially uh, specifically in, in in africa you could say except maybe for south africa um and local usually local banks have certain restrictions in terms of tenor um, which really applies then for independent power producers and their requirements for yeah, 18, 20 year of, of funding, um, but also looking at say distributed solar solutions and um, yeah, pay go um, solar home system solutions, even sometimes um, C and I. I think local banks and now speaking about Africa and that's also I guess different partly in, in, in for example India and more developed markets. Um, they, they are they still need to understand this business model in a better way and. Um, and the, the local banks are usually very much concentrated on, on lending against hard collateral. Yeah, so they provide a loan if you get a, a mortgage of a, 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 a house uh, in the in the capital. Yeah, so then they are very and it's simplifying a little bit. But but uh, so then but if you have maybe just secured against receivables, um, it's already getting much more difficult. And 
So that, that is one thing I think of what Sebastian also mentioned, kind of educating uh, local banks of the risks, challenges and opportunities of also distributed uh, solar. Um, and also I think there will be more and more specific, uh, specific financing lines from um, BFIs to local banks to provide uh, funding then to distributed solar. And of course, um, already DFIs provide um, so very large amounts of um, refinancing or long-term loans in, lo in hard currency, in dollar, euro, uh, to, to local banks, which they use for SME funding. Um, but as I said, I think for the specific distributed solar sector, um, there's still um, kind of a, a, a lack um, from local banks to um, of understanding and financing um, this sector. But coming to, to Patrick, of course, um, I mean, you, you face a very specific um, issue and risk, um, basically availability of, of hard currency. And I mean, from your business model, as I understand, it, if your income currency or your sale um, is in local currency, you, you should actually have local currency because um, now um, you say you only have to purchase the equipment and, and for this to um, you need hard currency. But at the end of the day, if you get a hard currency loan, you also have to pay back hard currency, which is very difficult to, to get in the market, first of all, and you take the, the devaluation or the foreign currency uh, risk. Yeah. So, um, so it's a very specific um, issue, I think. And I guess probably you have to price in a certain um, like very bad exchange rate for your operations in, in this market. Uh, I, I, it, what, what, but maybe Pair has a solution for this, but um, I guess there it's, if there's no availability really of um, hard currency, then it's, it's, it's starting very difficult. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And, and indeed, I, um, I wanted to invite Per also to, to comment on the challenges raised by, by Patrick, in particular, uh, when it comes to buying equipment in foreign, uh, in, in, in foreign currency and, and how, whether you think there is a good solution for that. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 again, the problem of uh, scarce dollars and, uh, and different exchange rate regimes that the central bank applies and different levels of access and black market. I mean, nobody's going to be able to solve that. But what, what we can say is that uh, if, if you, okay, you can borrow from a local bank and then you have your specific problem. Uh, and of course, if you can borrow from a local bank to begin with, that is already a challenge. But if you can borrow, and if the interest rates that the local borrower can offer are reasonable, if the collateral terms are surmountable, uh, then great. If that's a better deal than from an international lender, then of course you should take it. But then you specifically will have that problem still with your dollars. What we can say, without wanting to uh, promote international lending over domestic lending, but what we can say generally, that if you lend from, let's say, somebody like DAG, mm -hmm. and if what the, the product that you would need is a local currency loan, precisely what Eric is saying, because your long-term revenues will be in Naira, so ideally your long-term debt will be in Naira. The product that DG would offer, and all the, other, all the other DFIs essentially offer the same product, hedged by us, what they would do is they would provide you a loan, which is synthetically a Naira loan, which means that, let's say it's a million dollar loan, they, you, they would disburse dollars to you. You would actually receive currency, uh, dollar currency which you can bring onshore, but more likely you would even keep it offshore to buy equipment with. But the loan repayment obligation will be fixed in Naira terms at the exchange rate that applies at disbursement date. And then of course, when the loan is repaid, you must also repay it using dollars because DEG wants to receive back dollars, but the amount of dollars will be a function of the exchange rate. So if at the repayment date of the loan, let's say it's a bullet loan, and it was originally a million dollars, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, let's say 400 billion shilling, what, what, Naira, pardon me. If uh, five years later it is repaid and uh, uh, the, the Naira exchange rate has depreciated for 400 to 800, you must still repay 400 billion shilling, but now, but using dollars, which is now only half a million dollars. So you would, you would still need dollars, but you are not bearing the, the cost of the depreciation because you are also paying back less dollars. That risk is borne by uh, by DEG, which of course has passed it on to us. So we will supplement the missing half million dollars. 
Mm. Um, but so, so that product is actually interesting because it deals with your currency risk. Of course, you're going to pay a Naira interest rate to a DEG, so, so you, that, that needs to be considered. And how does it compare to the onshore offer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the product is a Naira, synthetic Naira loan, but you do receive dollar currency. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, you will have to repay also using dollars, but potentially less dollars, depending on what the exchange rate does, plus interest rate on it. So if the exchange rate remains stable, you could see that less dollars would enter the country than would have to leave the country because you also need to pay a dollar return on that. But from a central bank's point of view, that's not such a bad product because dollars are coming in and dollars are going out. I hope Thank that helps. Prepared. Thank you, Perry. That's uh, that's really interesting. So um, I would I would suggest to turn our attention a little bit to another case study, which is uh, Kenya. And I'm turning to uh, to Sylvia because uh, you mentioned that um, the, you you talked about the the, the PPA renegotiations in uh, uh, in Kenya, but we didn't have time to deep dive into that uh, case study in your presentation. And uh, and you also mentioned that the uh, recommendation of the task force is was to um, uh, to change the payments of the PPA into local. Uh, local currency. Um, so I was wondering whether you perceive it, this as a positive or a negative development. To what extent do you think this will um, affect private investors? Thank you, Matteo. Yes, the, well, the, the renegotiation was actually about the tariffs themselves. So the amount of the tariffs in Kenya, uh, as it's happened in many other countries, Ghana, India, just to mention some of them, this discussion about renegotiating the tariff of long-term PPA is a recurrent discussion. But in March this year, the president, Kenyatta himself, he appointed this task force uh, that after a consultation process with all stakeholders uh, came up very recently with this uh, report, it's a long report with recommendation. Uh, it's very well written, very very clear, I have to say, this, uh, this report, um, recommending a revision of tariff and also uh, making some recommendation about the, the, um, the currency. Uh, now, it's a recommendation, it's not binding, but since it's a recommendation, the task force was appointed by the president himself, it is very likely that this renegotiation will go on. Of course, it's a very delicate issue. So I guess that the government will need to find some sort of, of compromise of agreement with the IPPs. Otherwise, a retrospective renegotiation of contracts that are already signed, already effective, already operative, would undermine the confidence of investors in the country uh, itself. So basically, even as a renewable energy IPP, we might be happy about this renegotiation but because this will also open, pave the road for new renewable energy contracts. We are not happy about the concept of renegotiating uh, signed PPAs themselves because, I mean, we, we need to have certainty once we have signed a contract. Um, and I think that the specific recommendation of denominating future PPA in local currency, currency is quite reasonable. Uh, I think it will be followed because it entails benefits for the local economy. For, for instance, it will uh, increase uh, domestic investors' participation, it will promote the growth of local developers, it will promote the growth of a local supply chain. It is more sustainable in the long run and also because the task force uh, wrote that the agency implementing the monetary policy will be required, they use this word required, which is a strong word, uh, will be required to avoid fluctuation in the local currency and erosion of real value of money. And of course, stability of local currency will enhance the bankability of projects. What I say is the ultimate solution must be balanced. So, OK, local currency is something that is manageable, but the convertibility must be guaranteed. Even if we are talking about a currency that is also traded abroad, the convertibility is absolutely a, a must and the transferability as well. Thank you, Sylvia. And uh, yeah. Uh, very well noted, couldn't agree more. We only have five minutes left from the webinar and uh, I would like to um, uh, to, to dedicate these five minutes to a slightly pro uh, provocative question to, uh, to pair. Um, it seems, and this was addressed by some of the speakers, uh, that um, you know, hedging and local or lo local currency uh, finance uh, can be prohibitively expensive. Uh, so as a hedging solution provider, what is your take on this? What would be your advice to developers? 
yeah, that's a that's a that that, that is a, a perennial question and completely understandable, especially in emerging and frontier markets because of different macroeconomic conditions, inflation, a, a depreciation expectations generally, the local currency interest rates and also the hedge rates are higher than dollar rates. So there's always this interest rate differential. I think also you, you, you need to make, well, very gen that one very, very general comment. This notion that it is expensive is not, there's no basis for that in empirical fact. If you take our portfolio, which we always like to do because it's simple and it's, it's, it's watertight, we've done thousands of transactions in 70 plus currencies globally, a $10 billion plus equivalent. The interest rate differential is the cost of the hedge, right? The difference between a, a dollar loan and a local currency loan, between a dollar base rate and a local currency base rate, let's say between dollars and 2% and local currency and 12%, the difference of 10%, that's the cost of local currency. If you compare our portfolio and our history and all these deals, all those volumes and all those currencies transacted, on average, the interest rate differential, which is what we earn, and which is what the cost is of local currency is on average only one percent higher than the aggregate losses that we compensate all our counterparties for so on a portfolio basis again that's on a portfolio basis but a very very big uh a statistically very relevant pool the cost of local currency is on average one percent higher than the cost of dollar but if you realize that when you borrow in in local currency at a in expectation one percent premium you are not exposed to any volatility, not exposed to any shock risk. You have perfect predictability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is, of course, a no brainer. Everybody would hedge. That kind of analysis is also quite relevant when you're talking about on grid power, when you're talking about PPAs, because the theory of yeah, the, the theory of purchasing power parity, the economic theory, is that over a long period of time, uh, interest rate differentials and depreciation of a currency are very, very highly correlated. And this is also the, why the argument is very valid to say that the utility sector, like the Kenyan power sector, should be financed in local currency. Because you don't have a three-year window, no, you have a 50-year window. And over a 50-year time period, looking at it from the government's point of view, it makes total financial and economic sense to switch completely from dollar funding to uh, shilling funder. Yes, it comes in at a higher interest rate, but you eliminate the, the cost of depreciation and all those other uncertainties and the shock risk, which makes it a no-brainer deal. The story is very different, and this is of course where it comes in. If you're if you're an individual project developer in an off-grid business, if you're running a if you're doing a paygo uh, business in 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 Kenya and you are faced with a, a, a financing offer from an international lender, a DAG comes to you and says, yeah, you can, you, we can lend you in dollars. You're, you're a local currency business. You're a shilling revenue generating pay-go company. But DAG gives you an offer. Yeah, we can lend you in dollars at, uh, at 6%, and we can lend you in Kenyan shilling at 16%. It may still be the right point the right price from our pricing point of view from the risk point of view but if you're an individual borrower you're a cfo and you're turning every penny to make your business profitable and a success and you have to make that choice i'm going to borrow for five years at the at a cost of eight or a shilling at the cost of 16 or 18 what i forget the example i gave that's a very very difficult decision to make for an individual borrower and that is why you see in practice that many borrowers still choose the dollars. They say, well, "Wait a minute, I'm running a tight ship here. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna take the dollar loan. I'm gonna hope for the best. Basically, I'm gonna speculate that the shilling is gold, the whole firm, and then I will be actually saving money." That is a very legitimate decision for an individual borrower to take. And if the lender is happy to support it, if the, if the, both parties believe that they can weather the storm if it moves the other way, fine. What we are saying. Uh, and I come back to that point, uh, what we are saying that for the sector as a whole and for all the lenders involved and for all the borrowers involved and for the country involved, it is probably not the best thing if every company would do it, but you can understand why a single company would do it. And this is why we do and have uh, sort of, uh, that we do, we are now looking, let me be more co concrete, at putting together a facility with donor support that would 
that would slightly reduce the cost of local currency funding with one objective is to reduce the incentive for an individual borrower to speculate, to make it easier for the borrower and the lender, if they're faced with that choice, to choose the local currency alternative over the dollar alternative. So that is a, a thought that we have, and we're talking to the, 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 the wide industry and whether that's a good idea and how we should do it. And one of the critical things to consider is if you do something like that, donor based, donor supported, of course, you should never conflict with what local banks are doing. And Sebastian and I, for sure, are going to talk about it later. Uh, and one of the things that we are saying, if you want to offer subsidy on local currency debt from international lenders, what you should be doing is you should ideally link that subsidy to uh, arranging co-financing with onshore banks, because then you, you know, then you have sort of multiple uh, birds killed with one stone. You don't want to kill birds, but I mean, you want to be as effective as you can with whatever instrument you deploy. So that's uh, maybe a yeah, long answer to your question, uh, mate. Thank you, Per. And I think this is a very good uh, concluding statement. So with this, um, we've reached the end of our time today. I would like to thank all our speakers for the fantastic input presentations and, and discussion. I enjoyed it very much. The uh, presentations and the recording of the webinar will be published on, uh, on YouTube. So um, uh, we invite the participants uh, to, to, to watch, uh, watch them if uh, interested. Um, and um, yes, with this, uh, thank you also to Get Invest for the support to this webinar. And uh, I wish um, all our speakers and participants a nice rest of the day. On this slide, you can see some upcoming events and webinars from Solar Power Europe. And um, yeah, thank you again and goodbye. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.